my life down at your feet You're the only one I need Turn to you and you are always there Troubled times, it's you I see I put you first, that's all I need Humble all I am, all to you Just to hear you 
guests. We're glad you're here. My name is Brian Smith. I am our lead pastor, and uh, I hope you feel as our guests that you feel like you're part of family because we're all part of Christ's family. Amen? So just kick back, and uh, I want to jump into a, a story here to start. I want to take us back to the year is 2005. I was leading a medical team into the bush of uh, Zambia, Africa. And our medical team, the design of our medical team was to go into villages where Christ is not known, but also where medicine is not known. Uh, medicine is a great way to connect with people and share the love of Christ. And so we took this medical team way into this little village called Jembo in Zambia, Africa. To give you kind of a little picture of what was going on there, at that time, uh, Zambia was the last country in Africa to really curve the AIDS epidemic. About 33% of the people in the village populations were HIV positive. Tuberculosis was out the window, and everybody, we dealt with a lot of really sick people. And we're set up for a clinic the very first day, we're set up for a clinic. There's 100, 150 people on the veranda that have come from all these other small villages that day. And uh, we hadn't even got started. And I heard a shout. And somebody brought me a, about a six-month-old infant that was barely breathing, completely unresponsive. The baby had, uh, and his, the mom was only about 17 years old. They had walked in from a village several kilometers away. And the baby had drank kerosene the day before. And kerosene being a petroleum product, you know, that, that long the baby was septic, the baby was breathing about six times a minute. That child should have been breathing about 30 times a minute was normal. And all my years and my training, I knew we were in trouble because we were hours away from any hospital. And we're out in the middle of nowhere. And I looked at the missionary nurse and we jumped into a car. And I don't know if any of you know the roads of Africa, but they're really not roads. And we went as fast as we could in second gear. And we, try, and we had about a three-hour drive to the closest is a Catholic mission hospital in the village of Choma. And we're flying, and I'm doing everything I can with limited resources to try to keep this child alive. And I knew that we weren't going to make it. And I had a 17-year-old girl who's probably never left her village. And she's sitting next to me. She speaks Tonga. I do not. And I didn't know how to communicate her, and she was scared of us looking straight ahead. And I was, we were flying all over that back seat as we were navigating the roads. And I remember watching a child continue to go downhill and thinking, we're not even halfway there. And uh, we just turned off a road onto what they call the tarmac or an actual road with pavement. We still had about another hour to go. And the, the signs were getting worse. And I had exhausted the limits of what I could do. And so I prayed. That was the last thing I had. And I remember holding that child and saying, Lord, I can't do, there's nothing less I can do. And so this child is completely now in your hands. And I need a miracle. And the child stayed about the same. And I thought we were at the end right there. And as we screamed down the highway to the Choma Hospital, we, the child was still alive when we got there. We go roaming, uh, running in. We grab, the, they don't really have ER systems out there even. And so we go running in. We grab the doctor. We bring the doctor in. I set the limp baby. My arms are burning from the kerosene and the smell of the breath coming off the child. Um, I laid that baby down on a, on a bench. We're sitting there trying to convince the doctor to get excited about this, that something's really bad going on here. And he's looking at us like, we're crazy, and I'm getting really angry. 
And it's like, and I'm getting that point of why aren't you doing anything? And I ask him that, and he says, there's nothing wrong with the child. And I said, how? And then my anger, for those of you who know me, I very rarely get angry, but boy, it, it was coming out then. It's like, how in the world can you not think this child that nothing is wrong? He says, well, look at the child. We turned around, and the child was sitting up, wide awake, cooing, as babies do. And my jaw just hit the floor. I've seen this before. There's no way that baby was going to survive. And I looked at the missionary nurse next to, me, next to me, and she's seen a lot. She's been in the field a long time, and her jaw was on the floor. And he picks up the baby, and the baby lets out this big belch, and you can just smell the kerosene. And so he kind of believes that, yeah, there's something going on, because we need this baby, needs help still. And I sat there, and I thought, what just happened? And we got in the car, and if I write a story in my life, it always surrounds uh, the, a nice cold bottle of Coke, because <laughs> that's what we picked up on the way out of town. And I don't know how many words were said as we drove the hours back to the village. Um, and I looked at, at, at Bethany, and I just said, have you ever seen like something like this before? I have no words for what just happened. What did I just witness? I have an answer to that. We're on a, a journey here, a four-week sermon series about the power of our words. Week one, we talked about the power of how destructive our words can be. Week two, last week during Mother's Day, we talked about the power of our words and how they can give life. And this week, we want to share with you about the power of our words when we talk about how our words can be the most powerful weapon on the planet. So we would wonder, why, why do we need our words to be a powerful weapon? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the day that you decided to be a Christ follower, you painted a huge target on your back. And you awoke an enemy who is bent on your destruction. We have spiritual battle that comes the day we believe in who Jesus is and we follow him. And being a follower of Christ brings us to spiritual battle our whole lives because there's an enemy that's, that's bent on our destruction. He doesn't like us following God and he doesn't want our victory in Christ. And I think it's just simply amazing what God's word tells us in the Bible about how he equips us for this battle. And so when you walked into our guest, you got these, uh, this worship guide on the back. There's these sermon notes here if you want to follow along. There's some things, pay attention to this because there's some things I'd like some homework to give you during the week. But let's look at the first sermon note together. We are given a whole spiritual set of armor for this spiritual battle. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. The book of Ephesians is a very small book in the New Testament, way back here in your book. I'm going to be really reading from a New Living Translation. We're in Ephesians 6, and while you're turning there, we'll start in verse 10. And what's going on here is this is a very young Christian church that just started, and spiritual warfare was fired up. And Paul's encouraging these new believers, this is what it takes to get through a spiritual battle. And actually, we went to this scripture not too long ago that I'm going to read to you. And the focus isn't actually going to be on this scripture, but it builds a case for what's next. So I want, I want us to start here together. And we're going to put it up overhead so you can look at the translation that I'm reading from. So this is what Paul tells this very young church. He says, a final word. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor, all of it so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not, excuse me, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's a battle. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor that he gives us so that we will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, what happens? We will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes. Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God.
God gives us spiritual resources to battle in this life. Actually, he gives us, as it says, a whole set of armor. He gives us a belt of truth because an enemy comes and convinces us of the lie. So he gives us truth so we can stop that attack. He gives us a body armor of righteousness. What that means is when we live right within God's plan, it's like wearing body armor against what the world can bring. He says, wear shoes of peace. The good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us are the peace that no matter what we battle through, we have this peace that we know where we're headed. And we know we win in the end. He says he gives you a shield of faith. That says, Even when I don't understand what's going on, it's hard. I got this shield of faith that sustains me. And salvation, my assurance of where I'm going to be one day when he comes back is my helmet. And he says the last thing he gives us here is his sword, which is the word of God, which is powered by the Holy Spirit. God equips us from head to toe or wholly to withstand the biggest attack. But the armor and the sword are not the total package of how God equips us. He goes a step further to prepare us for battle. Look at the second sermon note. The most powerful weapon we have is words of prayer. The greatest and most powerful weapon any person in this room, including me, what we have is our words in prayer. After God describes all this spiritual armor and weaponry he gives us for battle, he summarizes it with the very next verse, the most powerful weapon that we have that holds everything together for our protection and for victory. And it's right there in Ephesians 6.18. The very next verse has to be tied. This is the one we want to focus on today. And let's read it together. The very next verse, after God gives us all this stuff, Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. He sews it all together with prayer. He says, this is the biggest thing. And so how does our words have this type of power? And I think there's a way to help us understand this. We have many military people here who understand that when you're engaged in warfare, the military prepares you, it gears you up head to toe in all types of military equipment, and you're out there in the battle, but sometimes you can still be overwhelmed by the enemy, and there's a resource. What can you do when you're surrounded on all sides and your resources are running out? Before you answer, our youth, you know this. When you're playing Call of Duty, right? And, and you're playing Call of Duty, and especially, I think, in the campaign mode, and you got all these resources you get in Call of Duty, and you're fighting, battling on the TV, and all of a sudden you're surrounded by the enemy and your resources are running out, what do you do? I do the same thing on my favorite game on my phone, which is tank battle. On tank battle, when I'm battling all these tanks, all of a sudden, uh-oh, I'm running out of everything. I still have this feature on this game. What is it? Airstrike. You can call in an airstrike. In the military, all you got to do is get on the radio and say, call up above and bring an airstrike. And what does an airstrike do? It levels everything around you. And that's exactly what Paul's saying in 618. He says, you have the power of your words in prayer to bring power from above to lay out the enemy around you. And that's why he uses this as a very important part of how God equips you for the spiritual battle. Our words in prayer bring a higher power that can do things that for us are humanly impossible. Our words of prayer have this type of a power against an enemy. Let me show you a list here. Our prayer can defeat the enemy by first interrupting his power. And the scripture verse here is, I want you to write that one down. I want you to write down Mark 9, 29. And I want you to go read that this week. The story here is amazing, but we don't have time to cover it today. But in synopsis, what it is is that Jesus sends out his disciples and they come across a boy who, is, who has a, a, a demon who, who puts him into seizures and convulsions. And they try, the disciples are empowered. They try everything they can to get rid of it and they can't. And it causes an uproar. And Jesus shows up 
and the spirit is dispelled. The spiritual battle is won by him. And the disciples say, how did you do that? And he says, this is the type of spirit that can only be removed by prayer. The power of words. So our prayer can defeat the enemy by interrupting his power. Our prayer can defeat the enemy by thwarting his plans. I like that word, thwarting. It's just fun to say. Thwarting. And I give you, when you write down Psalm 109, write this on your, on your, on your notes there, Psalm 109, 26, 31. This is actually a psalm prayer of how we battle. And if you want to thwart somebody's plans, this is what it reads. Here's a synopsis of what this section of Scripture says. It says, Lord my God, help me. Because you're loving, save me. Then they will know that your power has done this. They may curse me, but you bless me. They may attack me, but they will be disgraced. And then I, your servant, will be glad. I will thank the Lord very much. I will praise him in front of many people. Our prayer can defeat the enemy by interrupting his power, by thwarting his plans. The third is it can overrun his kingdom. The enemy has a kingdom too. And he has ground that he gains all the time. And 2 Corinthians 10.4, write that down and read that this week. This is how we gain territory. The power of our words, it says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, our weapons, which includes our words, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Our words have power to take back ground that the enemy has. And that's in our words of prayer. We have this amazing power in prayer with our words and that power comes from above. In our games, on Call of Duty, you only get so many airstrikes. Even in the military, we only have so many airstrikes for resources. But ladies and gentlemen, in the spiritual world, God provides an unending supply of airstrikes. And we all we have to do is keep calling them in. Our words of power in prayer are very vital in our lives, but this is a struggle in Christianity today is that we don't even be use our words of prayer. It's something we do off to the side or once in a while or over dinner. We don't even realize the power we have in prayer. We simply don't pray. We simply don't use our words because it's easy for us as Christians in America where it's free and we're prosperous to feel secure just the way we are. It's so easy to be dependent on our physical resources that we feel little need for spiritual resources. And let me tell you what prayerless life is like. You have the greatest weapon in your hands. I have this too. And when we don't pray, you just hand it to the enemy. You give him the weapon by not praying. You think about it, and I struggle with this. Think about what it comes to when it comes time to pray. Think of the million excuses we have that we don't. Um, I'm tired. Um, right now is not convenient for me to pray. I'm too busy. I will pray later. Where do you think those thoughts come from? There is an enemy that whispers in your ear, hey, you can wait. It's no big deal. Wait for a more convenient time. Take a nap first. Get this task done. Work's more important. And we agree. And we hand him the weapon. The enemy knows, if we don't, how powerful prayer is. The enemy knows it's the greatest weapon against him. And he will influence us in any way to not pray. And so we have to activate our prayer lives. And I'm writing this and I'm thinking the one hitch I have is probably a hitch a lot of people have is this thought of, I'm not sure God answers my prayer. Well, let me respond to that God always answers prayer. He's going to answer you yes very clearly. He's going to answer you wait or he's going to answer you no. He does answer prayer every time. It's easy when we see, yes, that time in Zambia, that was a clear result right in front of my eyes. And that, but ladies and gentlemen, that did a lot of work in me to believe that day. God knows I needed that a lot. Today I see him move. I don't need to go to Africa. I see it here every day. Every, you know, Donna just shared. Go hear her story. In a heartbeat, she's in a nice view, hanging on to her life. And this church surrounded her in prayer. And she's praying with us today. Don't write that off. 
But sometimes the answers are obvious. Sometimes he says, wait, you know, we live in an instant culture. I can watch any movie from my phone like that. I can get two-day shipping on anything from Amazon. We hate waiting. We hate waiting two days for that thing to come. And sometimes our words of prayer, well, we want answers right now. And sometimes and many times God says, wait. Why does he say wait? Well, here's a sh look at sermon note number three. Delayed answers to prayer, if we understand this, this helps. Delayed answers to prayer can be first waiting that grows us. Sometimes God delays the answer because he wants to change us. He wants to grow something in us. As Christians, we think God has a magic wand that can always say, hey, I need more strength. I need more patience. And he goes, ding, you got it. He doesn't do that. He takes us through something that gives us patience, perseverance, strength. He grows us by delaying the answer to prayer. Look for what he's trying to do in us to make us stronger. Second thing that delayed answers to prayer can be is it's a spiritual battle is raging. It's going on in the heavenly realms. There's scripture that shows delays in answer of prayer and activity because there is a waging war between the angelic host of God battling the enemy and all his minions. And sometimes that delay becomes because there's a war going on. And sometimes delayed answers of prayer can be because of God's perfect timing. Sometimes we think our problem is in spiritual battle is the microcosm of the whole world. Everything God, but God's probably doing a hundred things through what's going on right in our life. He's working with a hundred people and his timing is perfect. He's making all these things line up. And sometimes that takes a delay. But also sometimes God answers no. And I think when we see that it's usually because our motives are wrong, our perspective is off, and we're praying for things that God knows are not good to us or others. And when that happens and you sense God saying no, pray that he'll reveal to you what it is that's not within his will so we can change. So we look at all this, the power, the scripture talks about the power we have, the greatest weapon we have, and sometimes when we balk on it and think it's really not there. So let's talk about how do we use it. How do we use this greatest weapon? And look at sermon note number four. Our words, how do we do this? So in sermon note number four, it says our weapon of prayer is, is best in the power of the Spirit and at all times, in all circumstances, and with persistence. So we're going to go back and look at 618 together again. It lines it all out there for us. How do we do our words of prayer? How do we bring God's power to the situation? Well, let's look at that scripture again. It says pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So let's break this down. This is the main idea today. Walk away with this. All that armor stuff is amazing and good and we need it, but this is the part that pulls it all together. It says first pray in the spirit. What it's saying is that pray in the power. The day that you believed in Christ, you got God's Spirit inside you. You have the most supernatural power force, powerful force in the universe that dwells in you the day we believed. What Christ did on a cross made that possible, that God can actually dwell in us now. You have this in you, so we have to pray in that Spirit. Not on our own knowledge, understanding, and effort, but pray in the power that's in you. So pray in the Spirit. How often? All times. This happened on Pentecost when this was all poured out onto the church, which is people. He didn't pour spirit out on a building. He poured it out on a church, which is us. It says pray at all times. That does not mean you sit in your house and nama, nama, nama all day long. That's not what God calls. He's got all kinds of stuff he wants to do through us, but it means it's a posture that we're ready. My prayer life during the day is all kinds of different things. I can sit down in scripture and I can go and seek God through his word. I can sit there and watch something really cool happen and I have an immediate conversation with him saying, God, that was cool. I can watch a sunset at night and say, man, look at your brush. And I can look at the hardest thing going on day saying, I need you now. That is prayer. It's a connection with him and a conversation with him and recognizing his spirit. is now He's only not in our presence. He is in us. 
That's at all times. And it says pray in every occasion and in every circumstance. Every event in our life can have a response of our prayer. Good, bad, otherwise. Look at events happening around you as God's moving. And the last is be alert. Get your spiritual radar on and be persistent. When there are delays in God's response, don't stop praying. Ladies and gentlemen, there's people in this congregation right now we've been praying for for years and we're not stopping until God shows us his answer. Every morning at 7, I'm here with others praying. Every morning at 10, we're here, we're praying. Everything you ask us to pray for, but we need, that can't be a staff model. That is a congregational model. That is a body of Christ that prays like that, and you have power. Don't give up on prayer. And what happens as a church when we believe in the power of our words in prayer I think you just saw the best example right here on the stage a few moments ago, and that's our homestead ministry. And Natalie's life is a beautiful example of the power of our words in God's prayer and how many people have been behind her praying as she's navigated this. The homestead ministry is our ministry that receives women out of sex trafficking around the nation and puts them through a restorative, holistic process to re-engage your life and get back on a good track. In that ministry, and ladies and gentlemen, this is our ministry as a church. This is not something we give to and don't think about. This is our ministry that God has called us to. Everyone sitting in this room, this is our ministry. And that ministry is battling some of the darkest and deepest spiritual warfare that we can ever imagine. And when, when, when God brought it up to take this on, you, I think everybody gulped at how hard that type of ministry is. But God has provided. But ladies and gentlemen, that ministry needs your prayer every day. It requires your prayer. Our missionaries require your prayer. Our brothers and sisters who are here going through joy and going through suffering, it needs your prayer, your power of your words. Can you imagine what happens when a church prays? Amen. Back to Zambia. We'll close with this. In 2005, I, I don't know what happened to that infant boy or that young mother. I know the missionaries there said they've been trying to reach that village for a long time, and God showed up that day in a big way. I know he showed up big, and he answered my prayers. I was so stunned, I didn't believe it. It changed me. It had nothing to do with what I did. And I trust God is still at the work in the lives of that young family. And I smile because I know it wasn't me or my power, but it was his power that changed that baby's life that day, and it changed me that I see things a lot differently. And I'm looking forward to heaven one day when I get to hear the rest of that story. Ushers, would you come forward, please, for the offering?
everybody for being here today for our guests if you would just take a moment and fill out this connect card drop it off at our welcome center we would love just to connect with you but we're glad you're here we hope you come back graduates good job congratulations I know we're celebrating that today but I ask one thing is that you when you're leaving today go by the table out here from the homestead and celebrate with Natalie on her graduation would you go by and encourage her also today uh, so I want to finish with this put your hands together like this we have the power of our words through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to be in the battle. So my prayer for us is let's go get in the battle this week, but use the power given to us. Go out, engage the world, love them deeply, be bold, and have a great week.